Okay, I'm super excited about this paper. It's called An Image is Worth 16 by 16 Words. And the reason is this paper got me into Transformers two months ago when it was first published, like I think October 3rd. And it was under review and it still is. But uh, I'm going to try and do a deep dive today. So hopefully you'll find it useful. Um, basically, the first uh, time I read it, like on maybe October 5th or something, I didn't understand many details. So I took a step back, uh, went and researched NLP and Transformers specifically, like read 30 papers, even open source the original Transformer paper. And now I came a full circle back. So I'm gonna try and explain what I learned and hopefully um, make this paper clear for you. Uh, by the way, it has a hard dependency on the original Transformers. So if you wanna understand that, I have a, I have a Jupyter uh, notebook, uh, which you may find useful. So as usual, I'll just uh, link it in the description so you can, you can play with it. Um, okay, without further ado, let's jump into the deep dive. Okay, so the basic premise here is that um, we don't need so we don't need CNNs to solve computer vision as we thought until now. Uh, so Transformer did the same thing as it did in the NLP field. Basically, show we don't need CNNs, we don't need recurrence. We can uh, just do like attention, self-attention mechanisms, and uh, that should be enough. So. Yeah, it attains uh, super results uh, on the computer vision on the image classification task, and uh, it took uh, less time to compute, and that's what's amazing. So a big note here is that it achieved all of those results, which we'll see uh, really soon, uh, in the big data regime. So it needs a lot of images in order to accomplish these results. So that's that's a thing to keep in mind. So a good thing with Transformer in general is that um, they can be scaled up. So you probably know about GPT-3, which, ha which has around 175 billion params, and I assume something similar will, will happen with the Vision Transformer in one of the future iterations of, of this of this of this paper. Um, yeah, uh, ResNets are still uh, until until this paper were dominating the like uh, different benchmarks, image classification benchmarks. So. Uh, it's not like this paper was the first one to 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 introduce transformers to computer vision. That's that's not the case. Uh, many other people tried. So in the related work here, we can see that people already tried uh, doing some uh, sort of uh, attention. So including attentions into CNNs. Uh, so either uh, replacing certain uh, certain like uh, layers of the CNN with with uh, attention modules or just uh, kind of complementing it. And they uh, like there were also some approaches where people tried to use uh, some more like sparse attention patterns and stuff, but it turned out to be really complicated in the engineering uh, sense of the word. So yeah, they didn't pr give the results as this paper uh, did. So let's jump to the meat of this paper, and I'm going to try to explain uh, how it works using this image. Let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, so maybe first up like a high level overview. Uh, basically, what we have here is we have the input image, we split it into patches, and then we flatten those patches like in the raster order. So basically, this is the first patch, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. Uh, what we do then is we just flatten out those patches. And we do a linear projection here. We add the positional encodings. If you're familiar with the original transformer, I'll get into details. But like for now, this is a high-level overview, and then we just feed those into the original transformer. So this is the block here, uh, and then just uh, putting a simple MLP multi-layer perception head here, we can do classification, and that's the high-level overview. And now this transformer, just a short recap, uh, consists of these layers, which have uh, this uh, multi-head attention head multi-head attention uh, module, yeah, and uh, followed by like uh, uh, multi-layer perception. So that's the basic structure of the like the layer in the transformer. Now, let's zoom in a little bit and get into the details how it exactly works. I zoomed in a little bit and I'm going to tell you how th all of the details that go into this uh, pre-processing step uh, in the vision transformer. So we take an uh, image net image, uh, which has uh, like which looks like this, and it's twenty two twenty four 
by 224. And that's actually where the name of the paper comes from. So basically what they now do is they split the image into patches which are either uh, 14 by 14 in size or 16 by 16. They have three flavors. They have the base, the large and the huge model. We'll see that in a minute. But like, let's assume we use 14 by 14 here. And yeah, basically once you have uh, this, if you, if you divide 224 by 14, you get 16. So basically you have 16 by 16 patches and that's where the, uh, like, uh, the, the title of the paper comes from because we're basically treating all of these patches as simple tokens and we input them into the transformer so you can treat it as a word, whatever. Like that's just a, like a nice metaphor. Um, now what you do, you take this uh, patch, you flatten it out. So you get a vector that's like 14 by 14, that's uh, 196. I think. And uh, that's this part. So you, we are now here. And now we do the simple linear projection, which will uh, embed this vector into the model dimension space. So we'll, we'll basically, so for example, for the uh, base model, base vision transformer, they use uh, 796. So that's the same as bird base. So we end up with a, a vector that has uh, 796 dimensions. And now we are here. So finally, we just um, add the positional encoding to this representation, and we input it into the transformer, and that's pretty much it. Now for the positional encodings, if you're not familiar, what they did here, and they did some ablation studies, but they ended up using the 1D uh, positional uh, embedding. So you basically have a table like this. And so for example, uh, if you are using if you're if we're uh, looking at this spe specific uh, token, uh, so patch, uh, patch embedding, we just so because it's the first uh, patch, we just take the vector from the from this table from the position one. And uh, that's the positional encoding, which is actually learned uh, during the training. So that's the trick. So you just add this one to, to, to the embedded patch, and that's the final representation. So one thing I didn't, uh, didn't mention here, and this is similar to BERT, is that they use this, they have this notion of a uh, class um, uh, embedding, which is the same thing that BERT used. So uh, this one is also learned, and it doesn't come from the image uh, itself. It's just, uh, it just hard-coded in the model architecture. So that was the like a uh, detailed overview of how this uh, this stem part of the model looks like, and one sm uh, minor detail is that this linear projection it's a it's a like a basically uh, a matrix E, uh, so they it's and it's shared among different patches. So we use the same matrix E to project all of these um, uh, patches like fl flattened uh, vectors of the of the of the patches into the embedding patch. Uh, so yeah, that was that was everything uh, I wanted to to mention there. Okay, I zoomed out. Uh, let's go to to second important part, and that's so. Um, there is one thing in this model that's kind of uh, has uh, like inductive bias, and that part uh, has to do with positional encodings. So when you fine tune um, these these uh, models, so previous. Uh, Work so previous papers uh, showed that uh, when you when you fine tune on on like uh, for image classification tasks you want to fine tune on higher resolution. So what what you end up if you have higher resolution as a consequence you end up with um, like a bigger number of patches. So you're not 16 by 16 anymore. You, the, the the number of patches becomes bigger, so the sequence becomes uh, uh, like larger. And uh, because of that, the positional encodings wouldn't make any sense if you just applied them uh, during the fine tuning process. So you have to do 2D interpolation. So that's the only part pretty much where, so that's one of the parts where they introduce a bias. So the transform model itself has some biases like the residual connections, etc. But like, it's more general than some other models like CNNs and, and LSTMs. So that was an important thing to uh, to, to mention. Now, as I mentioned, we have uh, three variants of the model. They use the base and large, which uh, 
roughly correspond to BERT base and BERT large when it comes to model size. And then we have the Vision Transformer Huge, which is even bigger than, than, the, than the Vision Transformer Large. And let us see the, 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 the interesting results they got. So first of all, uh, we can see uh, two state-of-the-art so previous sodas on, this, on these benchmarks. And those were ResNets and EfficientNets. Now, when you take the huge uh, variant of the Vision Transformer and pre-train it on the JFT, which is a like Google's proprietary data set, which contains like 303 million images, um, you get basically uh, sodas like over on every single benchmark. And additionally, you have a lesser like you need less compute to do that. Uh, and if we take a look at, for example, this uh, Vision Transformer Large, it took only a 0 0.68 a uh, thousand uh, TPU v3 core days, and that's a mouthful. I'll explain it in a, in a minute. And basically, that that's uh, a much much less than 9.9 9 thousand that this uh, previous uh, ResNet took. So, what this means is every single TPU v3 uh, chip has two of these cores. So you basically need uh, if you if you have a, if you have a single TPU uh, v3 chip, you need 300 and 40 days to pre-train this model and <laughs> that's like a lot of compute that pretty much only Google and like like uh, richest uh, labs industrial labs in the world have so not everybody can reproduce this paper and that's that's the bad thing about this about these kinds of researches even though they do advance the field uh, people can kind of reproduce this and yeah that that sucks okay let me let's go further and interesting thing is this VTAB uh, benchmark. What it basically has, so VTAB is interesting because it has uh, three types of data. So first of all, it's low data uh, benchmark, meaning it only has around 1,000 images per, per task. And secondly, it splits those images into three categories. So natural images, which are kind of like cipher, uh, 10 cipher, hun cipher 100 uh, data set images, so like natural looking images like dogs, whatever, trees. And then we have uh, these uh, specialized images like medical and satellite images, and then they have this uh, geometric, I think, structured class of images. And basically what they showed is that the, the huge uh, variant of the Vision Transformer outperformed um, every other soda uh, across all of those categories, uh, which is really reassuring. So, so the, the transfer learning for these uh, huge transformers uh, uh, does work and it gives us nice results. Okay, going further, really interesting analysis they did here is how do these models perform uh, with respect to ResNets uh, depending on the amount of pre-trained data they have. And the left figure here, we can see when we pre-trained uh, the Vision Transformer on ImageNet, which has 1.3 million images, then on ImageNet 21K, which has 14 million images, and finally on J JFT, which has uh, 303 million images. How they, uh, what's the accuracy? What's the performance of the models? And as we can see here, uh, in the low data regimes, ResNets are the best, uh, and that's because they have a useful inductive bias, uh, meaning that the kernels uh, are basically um, th th that's the, the bias part of the, of the ResNet. Basically, you have you have the, have the kernel which uh, only looks at the local part of the image and can have a global like receptive field. And then going de deeper into the model, you get a, like a bigger receptive field. Um, that's one of the biases that uh, ResNets have. The second one is the residual connections. But yeah. Um, and the, the 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 best vision transformer is actually the base uh, the base variant, and that's not surprising actually. And then as we increase the the number of pre-trained data, we can see that finally uh, in the big data regime, the the huge variant of the vision transformer performs the best, and it's better than ResNets, and it's also more compute like efficient. So that's that's a cool thing. Uh, Right figure shows the same thing, just uh, like uh, splitting the JFT into smaller chunks. And we can see again the blue, like the, the, the light blue line here is uh, the uh, Vision Transformer Large. Uh, and it outperforms ResNets again in the big data regimes. 
So that was interesting. That was basically what this paper, one of the main points this paper made. Uh, in big data regimes, uh, those inductive biases that we put into our models like CNNs are not useful anymore and we should let the model learn those biases itself. And we'll see in a short, an interesting uh, showcase that shows us how the attention varies from, from diff in different layers. Uh, here, yeah, this figure is not so important. Basically, it shows that vision transformers are m more like uh, uh, efficient when it comes to compute. And this line is interesting. So third, vision transformers appear not to saturate within the range tried, motivating future scaling efforts. So you can basically expect uh, something similar to GPT-3 in the world of computer vision. That's my prediction. Uh, I mean, they'll probably stop as soon as as they see saturation, because yeah, you you gotta you have some like uh, like fixed budget. You you don't want to overspend if you don't get any gains out of it. So yeah, we can expect b a bigger vision transformer. That's for sure. Now this part is really interesting. This is the thing I was mentioning about the attention. So they took the large um, variant of the model and they analyzed the different attention heads. So particu in particular, this model has 24 layers and it has 16 um, attention heads. And what you can see here is in the shallower layers, uh, those attention heads, so some of them have a really localized attention. So they just uh, attend uh, pixels in the neighborhood of a, of a current pixel. Whereas the other um, uh, attention heads have a global attention uh, compared to CNNs, which only have local small receptive fields in these uh, shallower layers. So if I, I were to uh, draw how like CNN receptive field would change with the depth, comments will probably have a curve like this, like they would go linearly increase. So with every single la layer, you increase linearly the receptive field. And then once you have the, the, the whole, once every single pixel uh, attends to the whole input image, you basically stop uh, increasing the receptive field, and that's this is how the the, the CNN um, receptive field graph would look like. And so all of this region is where the vision transformer has an advantage, because uh, shallower layers can also attend uh, to uh, like the to, to global to, to every single pixel in the image, and that's what it gives it the the advantage, because it can learn how to attend and when to attend and the bias is not uh, needed in the in the big data regimes as I already mentioned. A couple of more interesting uh, figures here on the left. Uh, this is how the 1D positional encodings uh, uh, look like after the model has been pre-trained and you can see that the, this uh, 2D representation emerges. Uh, which is why, and we'll, we'll, we'll see that in the appendix, which is why other variants of the embeddings they tried, positional embeddings they tried, didn't work any better than the 1D. Finally, uh, they took the E matrix, so the, the embedding matrix, and they plotted the uh, like principal components. And you can see if you're familiar with AlexNet or um, Paper or CNNs in general, uh, you can notice that uh, these look like the kernels, like the same as the learned kernels that CNNs learn. So it's doing a similar thing, obviously, as, as CNNs. Let me zoom out and go and see the other parts of the paper. Uh, first, here is a nice visualization of what the transformer attends to. Um, and you can see it's meaningful. So this is what we would probably expect the model to attend to, like the sal salient objects in the picture. Um, Self-supervision. They also tried self-supervised approach instead of the fully supervised pre-training uh, pr approach. And it's still behind the supervised uh, training, but it's worth uh, discussing this part and I'll discuss it more in the appendix. Uh, again, yeah, um, I, I can I also expect, uh, let, let me jump over the references. So I'm, I'm expecting uh, to see like huge vision transformers uh, somewhere in the near future, probably. So I mentioned self-supervision, and if you're familiar with NLP, 
uh, you know that that's the way how big transformer models are pre-trained um, in the NLP field. On the other hand, computer vision was mostly about uh, supervised pre-training objectives. And uh, they, they, so in this paper, they tried doing self-supervision uh, in the context of computer vision. And uh, they did get uh, encouraging results, still not as good as supervised uh, results, but like they basically, so how, how they did it, is they followed, they did it similarly to how BERT, uh, if you're familiar with BERT, so they did a similar approach. They corrupt 50% of the uh, input pa uh, patch embeddings, and they did, they tried to predict three things. First is the mean color uh, of the of the patch. So so you take basically, you, you take a patch embedding, the original patch embedding, you find the mean uh, value, so that's the mean color, uh, then you mask it, and then you make the model predict what the uh, color should be depending on the context. So that's how the self-supervised thing works. Uh, they didn't only try the color, they also tried uh, predicting the downsampled version of the patch embedding that's like four by four instead of uh, like 16 by 16, uh, as well as the color. And they also tried uh, regressing the whole thing. So like doing auto encoding pretty much. And as I already mentioned, uh, results are not as good, but that's a promising like research direction. So yeah, we can expect innovation on that on that front um, Let me go through two more sections which I found important the first one they did a scaling effort to figure out which uh, How should they scale their model to get the best performance out of it? They tried doing depth they tried doing width they tried making patches smaller and like obviously depth uh, gave nice results uh, as we can see here on the graph, um, on the chart, uh, basically uh, increasing depth uh, gives us better performance. The compute also goes up, obviously, but like, yeah, increasing depth uh, will in increase the performance. Now, the interesting thing for me is that patch size, the smaller it is, uh, they, they gain more performance. So I'm gonna make a prediction now. Basically, somebody will take uh, some of the efficient transformers like Reformer, like Longformer or Leanformer, and they'll uh, do the same thing as a vision transformer. They just use smaller patches and they'll get better results. That's a research I can, I can expect uh, to come over the next months. And finally, let me finish up, wrap up this already long uh, deep dive. Um, up, do, like talking a little bit more about uh, positional encodings. Uh, they tried four things and the, the, the biggest gap was uh, between using no positional embeddings, i.e. treating the patches as a bag of patches, and using 1D uh, positional embeddings. So that's where the, the highest gap was and you can see here the numbers. So uh, using positional embeddings helps. Now how do you, how exactly uh, do you like uh, which heuristic do you use, let's say, let's call it that way, uh, that matters a bit less. So they tried 2D positional embeddings and 1D, which I already explained. Let me try to quickly explain how the 2D positional embeddings work. Uh, they basically have two tables this time. And how you index into these tables is the following. So you have your input image. Again, you split it into patches. And so this one will be uh, patch 1.1, one, one. this one will be patch 1.2, this one will be patch 1.3, uh, this is row 2, etc. So you basically take the indices, so let's say this patch will have 1, like, so basically take, so this is 1, 2, same here, 1, 2. You basically take the first embedding here, and you concatenate it with the second embedding here. So this represents the X dimension, this one represents the Y dimension, and you just train uh, the transformer like that. And they showed that that approach won't do anything better than just using a simple 1D uh, positional encoding. So that was pretty much it. Uh, this was already probably too, too long. Uh, hopefully you found this video useful. Uh, this is the first time I'm doing like a deep dive, like a semi deep dive uh, of a research paper on this channel. Uh, if you found it useful, uh, please leave a comment down in the description if you'd like me to uh, make more of these. And yeah, 
uh, subscribe if you haven't already and click that bell icon to get notified when I upload a new video and until next time keep learning 